Today, has Rishi Sunak got Brexit done? Was the king right to meet the EU Commission president? And just what is causing Britain's salad shortage? With me today on Politics Live, Conservative MP and former Minister Kit Malthouse, Shadow Environment Secretary Jim McMahon, former Labour Home Secretary Jackie Smith and the political journalist and commentator Isabel Oakeshott. Today, the Prime Minister heads to Northern Ireland to sell his new Brexit deal. We need a functioning government here and that's what you need, that's what you deserve and that's what I believe we've created the conditions to now make possible. The deal's been widely welcomed, but not everyone is yet convinced. My gut instinct is it doesn't cut the mustard. We're not there. The government needs to keep pressing and showing that if you push Europe, you will get changes. Was the King right to meet the EU Commission president? Also today, what more can be done to prevent people crossing the Channel in small boats? This former Home Office minister has come up with his own solution. And what's causing the shortage of salad in our supermarkets? Let's start with one of those stories in the headlines. Here is the Daily Mail. There's King Charles meeting Ursula von der Leyen yesterday after the press conference where she and the Prime Minister announced the Windsor framework with the question, could this meeting be a moment the King comes to regret? There was some consternation at perhaps uh, the monarchy uh, being involved to some extent uh, with politics, although, of course, the talks were completely uh, separate. Should it have happened, Kit? Of course it should. I mean, I, I find the whole thing a bit odd. I mean, if the president of the European Union, which is why over 500 million people, happens to be in town and the same town in which you live, why wouldn't you drop in? And if you think about it, if the roles had been reversed, if, if the king had gone to Brussels, it would have been a bit odd if he hadn't dropped in on the president of the EU. So it seems perfectly reasonable, particularly given that he's newly enthroned and therefore it seemed only polite for me to me for her to drop in and say hello. Was it too close for comfort uh, for you, Jim McMahon? But I think we all recognise the, the soft power of the, the monarchy and the king, and that's important, and we deploy that for our diplomatic uh, ends on a regular basis. We need to make sure, though, that the government don't overstep that, and I think providing that the lines of separation are in place, then the king the monarchy has a role to play, uh, but the government needs to be very careful they don't misstep on it. Kit Morehouse, you're looking very sceptical. Yeah, it just seemed like a perfectly normal thing for, for the monarch to do. I don't know why, why, why there's a sudden massive constitutional implications that he might it's meet not, the president of the no, it's European Union. It's not a perfectly it's... normal day, though, Kit, it is. is it? It's, it's the culmination of an extremely controversial set of negotiations with a lot of politics to be played out, and I don't think it was, the king was well advised to meet or to, to look at the very least as if he might be engaging in that political debate. I think the difficulty here is that for Brexiteers, Ursula von der Leyen is a bit of a toxic figure. So that's why it's controversial. I have to say, as a Brexiteer, I can't find myself getting terribly worked up about it. The crucial thing is that neither Ursula von der Leyen nor any of her lackeys reveal any details of any conversation that happened. I would be a bit nervous uh, about that coming out if I'd been in charge of that decision. All right, well, let's uh, keep with the subject of the uh, Windsor framework. Um, it's been, uh, well, it's landed rather well in the press. I should think uh, Rishi Sunak is basking um, in the, the sort of warm glow of newspaper headlines. Uh, of course, it hasn't been welcomed by uh, the Democratic Unionist Party yet, hasn't been rejected either. But let's just take a couple of the uh, headlines there. The Daily Telegraph, a Sunak, my deal is a new way forward. And if we have a look at uh, one of the other headlines, in the papers, The Guardian, the Prime Minister hails new chapter in relations with EU after Northern Ireland deal. Um, of course, after meeting and announcing the framework with Ursula von der Leyen yesterday and then also in the Commons, uh, the Prime Minister has travelled to Northern Ireland to try and sell the deal there, particularly to the Democratic Unionist Party, who are key in terms of their support for this new arrangement uh, with the EU. Uh, let's listen to the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, uh, Geoffrey Donaldson. The progress has been made. 
we continue to have some concerns. We will examine the legal text. We'll look at all of this in the round and come to a decision. We're reasonable people, uh, but we want to ensure that what the Prime Minister has said is matched by what is actually mm. in the agreement itself. Can it deliver on the um, areas of concern that we set out? Will it, do you think, Kit Morthouse? Well, I hope so. I mean, look, there's 100 pages to plough through. I, haven't, mm. I have to confess to you, Joe, not yet ploughed through all of it myself. But it looks to me like a, a huge advance on, on where we were. Um, and as I say, it's going to be interesting over the next few days to see. I mean, these things often have a huge reaction at the start and then over the next three or four <laughs> days, you know, they kind of picked apart and the little bits of grit in the oyster But Do you think uh, you should have gone for a vote sooner so, rather than later? No, no, then, no, no I think it's that. quite right to give it a bit of time so that people can digest it and see the idea of bouncing anybody at, at this sense mm. moment would have been a bit nuts. So, I mean, from my point of view, you know, you might remember... Uh, Joe, many years ago, when well, well, I think all the multi house compromise. This, there are, there are it, threads of the compromise in there. Well, um, I, this I, idea of the I being... was struggling to remember the Malthouse yeah. compromise myself at the time, but yes, you it did tweet. A, uh, I can see the DNA of the so compromise. It was a, it, was a um, uh, it did run the risk of just being an obscure GCSE politics question, but actually, some of the stuff that we worked on, me, Steve Baker, Robert Buckland, Nicky Morgan, Damien Green, Stephen Hammond, is kind of in there, and you can see the DNA of it within. So I'm hopeful that we'll get there. I mean, look, I think it's a it's a deal that we should take. Or take. Uh, let's take it, make it work, and then see where we go from there. Right. That's a critical thing, isn't it? And I'm really glad you didn't use the phrase, you know, getting Brexit done, because what this is is actually a starting point. It's not an end point. It gives oh. the ability to actually make something of the Brexit opportunity. Because it, now, hasn't, I, done it so hasn't done so far. I, well, it hasn't. I mean, wh why would I sit here and pretend that the Brexit opportunity has been maximised? Now, my suspicion is that the reason that the EU has agreed to this framework is because they don't have any real concern uh, that this government or indeed the likely Labour government that follows it is actually going to make the most of the Brexit opportunity. We're not going to deregulate. We're not going to lower taxes to make Britain more competitive now we're out of the EU. Therefore, the EU has nothing to worry about. So it's up to you guys now. You've, oh. you've pulled this off. Now make the most of it. Uh, Jim, is that right? Future Labour government wouldn't make the most of it. Well, I mean, the starting point is that this is progress and we should welcome that progress has been made. Uh, Labour has been very clear that there are elements of this that were on the table for some time and actually we could have got here uh, sooner. Labour's committed to uh, supporting it as it passes through the House. But we, we all know that simply winning a vote in Parliament it really is never the test in Northern Ireland. It's whether you can win trust and confidence of all communities in Northern Ireland to make this work in practice. Because for the people of Northern Ireland, of course, they want this agreement in place, but the Assembly, the executive needs to be in mm. place to make sure that decent public services on a day-to-day -day basis can be provided. I have what to say, it sticks in the throat to hear you complaining about things should have been done sooner. It is your party, along with others, that have systematically attempted to block Brexit ever happening, well, no, sorry, as a result of which it's taken a lot longer than it would have done it's, it's if they'd been allowed to get no, on with sorry, the job. I'm sorry, we, we, you know, as somebody who wishes we had never left the EU, I accept that we have, but we were told by you and others campaigning for Brexit that this was all sorted, mm. that we would be exactly. able to see the benefits. You've conceded, we haven't seen the benefits have, so far. Yeah. And, that, and that actually, you know, we'd got an oven-ready deal. Well, conclusive proof that we yeah, never you spent, did have. You spent years so we've preventing got, work no, on it by no, making yeah. everyone utter, go through a series utter, of no, I'm sorry, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's jack it I'll come to you. I'll come to you. I'll come to you. We were told. We were told. Well, quite. We were told that it would take place Hang on, hang on. Let's jack Because people can't hear if you talk over each other. We were told that this was all sorted, that we were now in the sort of open waters of Brexit. That clearly wasn't so the case. So you make it more oh, difficult. Oh, Isabel, shut up. Uh, excuse me. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's not, not, let's not descend. Let's not descend into insult. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Civility and politics. Yeah. Is that well, we'll your come example? on to that. I mean, we'll come is that your on to example that. of politeness and, and politics? And I'm in a... Because it's low and Yeah, poor. and the re... Oh, come on, Isabel. All right, let's return, let's return to the substance on this issue of who stalled what at the time. I mean, I think it was both sides, wasn't no. it? There were Conservative MPs yeah, who yeah, also brought... Yeah. Who but, also... But, but, but I think the use no, of language here is really important. The, the, the use of a phrase like stall completely misrepresents what was taking place at the time, which is that all of us were trying to reconcile completely new territory and trying to find a solution that reconciled leaving an institution that we've been part of for decades in a completely unknown territory when it came to our borders, uh, how we treat the movement of food, uh, labour supplies and all the other issues that are now coming to pass. The concerns that were raised then 
about the deal not being robust are proving to be the case. We've literally got food rotting in the fields and supermarket shelves empty on the other side. Why? It's because not it's not been made to work. Well, well, I was trying yes. to make... Yes, all right. Let's the point, hang on. I'm going to let Jackie well finish her point and then we're going to just move on a little bit. The Go point on. I was trying to make without... In hang on, Isabel. Go on. Without interruption was, I think, as Jim says, a real test of this will be whether or not we can now get back to a situation where the institutions, the devolved institutions in Northern Ireland, are able to get back and operate again. And that's why I do think this is a step forward. I do think, as Kit says, it's right that there should be time for the DUP and others to look at this in detail. But we've got to get back to a position where the people of Northern Ireland have got the government necessary to help them to solve all of the problems what? that they're not able to do at the moment. Well, Rishi Sunak has uh, one idea. He was extolling the dual market access um, that Northern Ireland uh, is now in a position, in his words, to uh, capitalise on. Let's have a listen. That is the prize that is on offer. Because if we get this right, if we get this framework implemented, if we get the executive back up and running here, Northern Ireland is in the unbelievably special position, unique position in the entire world, European continent, in having privileged access not just to the UK home market, which is enormous, fifth biggest in the world, but also the European Union single market. Nobody else has that. No one. Only you guys, only here. Right. Well, it if that's such a unique... Of course. Well, uh, exactly. <laughs> that is the position, of course, that the UK had. Yeah, well, that's a reflection of the kind of unique geographical and, and cultural nature of, of Northern Ireland. But for me, I mean, well, one of the yeah, reasons that I've... Hold on a minute. One of the reasons <laughs> that I voted to leave the European yeah. Union was because I thought there was a much bigger, wider world out there that we needed to address and that, in fact, the economic poles of the oh, earth are tilting on. to the east well. and we needed to change our trading patterns to, to deal with that. But now, is there something yeah, ironic yeah, listening... On, no, hang on, I'm going to put... Is there something ironic listening to a Prime Minister who voted in favour of the UK leaving the EU, the single market for goods, um, extolling the virtues of that very unique position that Northern Ireland now finds itself in. No, I don't think so. He's trying to sell a deal in, in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland has, as I say, a particular geography and a particular sensitivity that puts it in a particular position. We don't, uh, you know, the, the, the islands of Great Britain don't have a land border that needs to be looked at with the European Union, right? We have a sea border. But as I say, the overall thrust of Brexit was change in our trading patterns. Um, you know, from my point of view, I mean, I know everybody says that we haven't seen the benefits of Brexit. Look, it took us 14 years to get into the EU. The idea that overnight everything well, was going to suddenly change um, is, is crazy. And I have to say, life was made a lot more difficult by the way the House of Commons... All right. Well, no, that is absolutely true. ...up to the round of 2019. Um, so would, I think the benefits you... will come over time. Well, would... Yes, maybe they will. Um, but would Labour, would you like to have the position for the rest of the UK that Northern Ireland now has in terms of that dual market access? No, we're very clear in terms of the uh, the customs union and the single market that the position is set. But that doesn't mean that we can't have uh, a better working relationship with our European and a uh, trading one. partners than, than we have. Because in the end, what do we see? We see businesses that were trading within the EU now aren't trading. And that has a direct impact on jobs here in the UK. That isn't what people voted for. And it's the responsibility of government to make sure that whatever international trade agreements are in place serve the British people well. And at the and moment, the other there thing, are questions. And the that. other thing that's encouraging about this is that it is an example of Rishi Sunak engaging in a positive way yeah. with the EU, which is not, which frankly wasn't the case with Boris Johnson. And of course, we still don't know time. if he's going to want to play politics with this deal either. And that means that we can now start thinking about things that are really crucial, like a proper security deal with the EU to help to keep us safe. In other words, you know, filling some of the gaps that Brexit has left, both in our economic and our national security. Uh, but would you like Keir Starmer to be advocating closer alignment uh, with the EU in the way that Rishi Sunak seems to be doing this unique position of having access to the EU and uh, the rest of GB? Look, I know where... I understand where Keir Starmer is. I want there to be a Labour government, and I think that will take us even closer to the EU than we would be. Uh, but, you know, he's not... I mean, well, what we've yeah, actually because... got to do now is deregulate and make ourselves more competitive. Otherwise, there's no point to the whole exercise. So we're, the government is about to put up corporation tax. Mm. It's the exact opposite of what we should be doing. Right, well, what do you say to that, Kit Morthouse? Well, look, I, I've been uh, public in, in the past in my desire to have a, a low-tax enterprise-based economy that 
relies on the operation of the free market. So I've Good, been proposing you. that for, you know, 30 years as a politician. So the government's making a mistake politician. going ahead with corporation tax from 19% to 25 I think they should think very seriously about the economic impact, yes. Uh, you do? Mm -hmm. uh, and that would be in the budget? Well, we'll, we'll have to wait and see what, so. what Jeremy Hunt decides to put in the budget. But can I just pick up that I've said previously elsewhere we're not going to tax our way to prosperity. Well, uh, Jackie mentions the tone. Do you think Rishi Sunak has uh, achieved something that previous Conservative Prime Ministers have failed to do over Brexit because of the way he carried it out? I think it's been a combination of things, to be honest with you. I think definitely... You know, the change in personality and approach may have made a difference. I think the fact that we've got new leaders in some European countries uh, also will have made a difference. I think the fact also that, you know, unfortunately, the horrendous war in Ukraine has, has bound all, all of us together in a way perhaps we weren't uh, before. And also that uh, many other uh, countries like Germany have got bigger fish to fry. I mean, the German economy is in really dire straits at the moment, and I suspect they've got an eye to that as well. I mean, so I, I, there was I, I, an element of everybody tiring and wanting to move on, and it, maybe the timing was propitious. Let's be honest, the, the real change has been tone and integrity. Boris Johnson said there was, an, there was an oven ready deal that didn't exist. He set us to war with our biggest trading partners with the use of language that wasn't helpful in the negotiation and any form of diplomacy was completely put to one side. What we're seeing here is, when constructed well, when there are when there's good faith in a negotiation when we work to a common interest that we can achieve far more than if we go to a, a, a diplomatic um i wouldn't say war's not the right word but we can't have this division where it's you know if one wins one's got to lose in the end in terms of trade uh, in terms of our common uh, endeavor we do need to work closer together well look i'm all for constructive engagement absolutely but the thing i think we've learned over the last whatever few years with the european union is things are impossible until they're not um, oh. and then well, I mean, so, I mean, but has Boris, Boris, did Boris Johnson did Boris Johnson actually fail in his endeavour ultimately? What Boris Johnson was trying not to do was cripple his own negotiating hand. You don't you don't go into a negotiation saying I'm never going to pull the plug on something. Otherwise, how are you ever going to achieve what you want to achieve? And I'm sorry, but listening to you, you know, it's motherhood and apple pie what you're talking about. Let's be nice to the EU. It's honesty no, you're talking about. To, it's honesty not, and integrity. It? Boris Johnson said there would not be checks on goods going to Northern Ireland, and it was not true. It but was not true in his agreement. Sell, it's being able to sell our goods. It's having businesses that can succeed, and it's having a secure country. That's what. That's not motherhood and apple pie. That's real politique. You know, you've got... Fair, you know, fair dues to you, Isabel. You've been very clear about what you want from Brexit. You want our... Uh, workforces to be less well protected. You want a low Never tax. Never said I want a low. Sorry, where did well, you get sorry, that from? Sorry. What are you talking about? What, what are you talking about when you say you let's about? most no. let's make the most of deregulation? What it usually means is. Let's remove some of the rights that I've our... i said that we should our, remove rights. So what sort of, de re what sort of deregulation rights. are you in well, favour of, then, I, I don't Isabel. think that we should sit here and have a detailed conversation about individual bits of deregulation. We have got to find ways to make ourselves yeah, more you, competitive. But people You've might want to know... to outline what these benefits are. What, which regulations well, is it you want to remove that we well, haven't Well, the clinical been trials directive set medical research back two decades. Um, we could have a much more coherent and science-based approach to clinical trials than, than they do in the EU, as an example. Any other Happy examples? You can't have a, if you want a small one, you, in the EU you can't have a throttle on an electrical, electric bike, now we can in the UK. I mean, there's all sorts of little, little ones and big ones that we can and should be dealing with. And would that, that make us more competitive? Isabel, anything that you would well, like I'm, to see? I'm actually much more focused on the tax situation. I mean, look what happened with AstraZeneca recently. They are setting up a new base, which is not going to be where it should be here in the UK, because we're simply not competitive. But there was nothing about that corporation tax discussion that you would have had that we couldn't have done whilst we were still a member of the EU. Well, there's VAT limitations, aren't there? Let's move on to something that Rishi Sunak will be hoping to capitalise on further following his Windsor framework. This headline in The Times is by Kit Malthouse. Let's swap channel migrants with genuine refugees from France. Just to be clear, this is Kit Malthouse's mm. suggestion. It's tackling small boats that Rishi Sunak wants to try and deal with. It's one of his pledges. He's going to meet the French president, Emmanuel Macron, next week to talk about this. Um, what is your idea exactly? Right, so it does take a bit of thinking through, but bear with me, right? So um, essentially what I... I thought was, well, the, the government's bringing some legislation to help deal with this problem and they've thrown lots of things at the issue. Um, and all of that is welcome, but hasn't really made much difference. The numbers have mounted. And the reason the numbers have mounted is that we're dealing with uh, business people here. They're making a decision about price versus risk. People it makes their life a bit more difficult. They lower their price to maintain demand. So the only way we're going to, to stop 
the, the cross-channel traffic and the dangerous traffic and the deaths on the beaches is to say, right, let's prevent people's ability to cross altogether. The only way we'll do that is by having immediate returns to France, quietly, we are, in theory, able to do that because the um, advent of military primacy in the Channel means that between the two, the operational relationship is so good, we're intercepting between us now about 95% of people crossing. 95%? 95% of people, whether on the beach in France, in the water, oh, or on, on the beach, are okay. intercepted. Mm -hmm. So we're now able to say, right, we'll return 100% immediately. How do you persuade the French to do that? You mm. say, well, OK, in exchange, we will take a refugee from within France who wants to resettle in the UK in a controlled and orderly fashion. Now, the key thing to remember is that by doing that, no one would think it's worth crossing. And if no one crosses, we wouldn't have to make any exchanges. So the paradox is, by promising to do this exchange, we wouldn't have to do it in the first place because the traffic would evaporate. And in the short term, given that the good weather is coming, numbers are likely to mount, and... Uh, uh, Rishi Sunak's got a summit with Macron on the 10th of March to talk about these issues. It struck me as maybe a, a kind of elegant solution to what is a problem. Imagine you're, it. I'm, I'm former Home Secretary, and I will, I'll come to all of you. What do you think? Well, fair use to Kit for trying to think about a practical solution to this as opposed to a dog whistle Rwanda solution that has achieved nothing so far. But, of course, the fundamental pull factor to people across the Channel is the fact that you can arrive here. I mean, let's not forget that most of the people that come across the Channel do then have their applications for asylum approved. Mm. So they've got a legitimate case. But it takes so long that those for whom there is not a case there is no ability to return them quickly. So I agree with Kit that actually returning people quickly is the most important thing. The fundamental change that needs to happen is the Home Office has got to get a grip of the length of time it takes to decide whether or not somebody has got a viable right to stay in the UK or not. And that's the real challenge. And that would prevent, I think, quite a lot of the, the, the people, the terrible trafficking that's happening across the Channel, as would more engagement of our law enforcement. Isabel, do you want to ask Kit or interrogate him on his idea? Well, no, initially I, I thought this idea sounds absurd and very it's quite hard to get your head Why? Right. Which but bit actually, did you think was absurd? Because you're you're essentially doing you're not you're not actually net better off in the initial stages of your idea. In terms of numbers. For, because we're taking a, a an established refugee, somebody whose claim is is legitimate, in exchange for them keeping one who would have come over here. So we're still getting the extra numbers. But I accept your point that quite soon it would be apparent that there would be no point making the journey. Um, I, I slightly fear it's not going to happen. I kind of struggling to imagine um, the, the French authorities kind of getting on board with this. Mm. But we do need imaginative ideas. You're completely right that none of what's been proposed so far is happening. And I think it is encouraging uh, that these statistics that you found, 95% is intercepted, then, you know, that really does raise the question, why are we not better at doing the next Well, that's bit? why Manston is, was so full, because we're intercepting almost all of them as they come across. And, and the, the armed forces have done a fantastic job forging a great relationship with the French to make that happen. The key thing, though, is, and you're quite right, Isabel, in the early stages, neither side, French or British, are worse off. We're all about the same on numbers. But as the incentive to cross goes, yes. two things would happen. First of all, nobody would cross, so there'd be no exchanges. All those people gathering on the French coast wouldn't bother. They either wouldn't come or they'd disperse and go elsewhere. And those that wanted to make a claim for asylum could make it in France if they were going to make it at all. Right. Well, so nobody on. is in a, in well, a worse situation. But the key question, But the key Kit, thing is, sorry, Joe, is the French authority... Have you actually spoken to the French authorities? No. Has anyone? No. Oh, right, OK. No. No. No, I'm not a minister. I have no contact with the French authorities. It's not my job <laughs> to go out and do that. No, but even point. sounding it out. But the key thing is to remember, you've got to separate two issues here. There's, there's a whole conversation to be had about refugees and how refugees access the UK. Now, at the moment, as you know, we have a number of bespoke routes, whether it's um, Afghanistan or Syria or Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, or the Afghanistan Hong, routes right? are we pretty well closed, We have a well number closed, of bespoke actually. routes, and there's an argument to be had. But there's a separate argument, and the, I think the problem is we conflate the two to be had about how we stop this incredibly dangerous and evil trade across the channel. All right, and that was what I'm primarily focused on. OK. But I think that's a real issue, isn't it? Because in the end, this is a distraction and an admission of failure. You know, since Rishi Sunak stood up in uh, November and said that he would end the small boat crossing, the backlog on asylum uh, cases, decisions, has increased by 50%. 
That's happened because the asylum system is completely backlogged and it hasn't got the capacitor. And in the end, you have got to resource the Home Office to turn around those applications to make sure that those who have a right to be here can be here so that they can live a settled, uh, stable life. And those I, people who don't have I a right Jim, to be here I, don't I mean, Jim's right here. about the backlog. And, and I think the Prime Minister said he's putting 400 more people into the... No, 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 but, 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 the, but, the, but the key thing to remember is that the numbers issue. have gone up because we had a big bump of people coming over the summer. And it's worth taking a well, step back and saying... Hang on a second. Can I just tell you there? Because I've got this graph here from the government saying migrants crossing the channel in small boats alone for 2022 was over 45 and a half thousand um, so separate to the schemes that you're talking about more recently yeah. for Ukraine oh, and Hong Kong the numbers um, but just so, so those are the those are the numbers yeah. that have gone up and that's the and problem I'm trying now, to solve and only now the government is saying it's going to put more resources in terms of actually uh, processing applications so it has been a failure hasn't it well it depends right you can look at two sides of the well, coin, yes right? it has so, so, just all so first of all you can say that this is a failure, but you have to step yourself, step back and say, why in the last two or three years the numbers ramped? Well, the reason they ramped was because we were so successful at closing down the route through the tunnel no, the, 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 and right. across the channel, that's right? A, so all a, those stories of people gathering right, well, at Sangat and all that, that doesn't happen now. Imagine but Jim, what would you... found but, another way. But, 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 Jim, in, what would in, Labour in, do in terms yeah. of deterrent? I mean, this is an idea. Uh, yes, you're right, you're not a minister anymore. You haven't spoken to the French authorities. It would be intriguing to know what they think of it. Um, but what would your concrete proposal be? In the end, you have to clamp down on the criminal gangs that are exploiting vulnerable people and who are abusing our asylum system. But they're doing system. that now. That's the pursuit. Uh, and, and, and so the question and, and is then... Not the how gangs many, just not, get replaced so every time you arrest And so the them. question is, how many criminal gangs have been arrested and locked up for abusing people and trafficking people across the channel? Why are how we many? accepting well, anyone from Albania at all? I mean, why should the Home Office fanny around spending months or even years looking at interesting cases language. From, from Albania. I mean, I genuinely would be really interested in Jackie's perspective as to why the Home Office, from your experience in it, is so incompetent in this area? Is it a numbers? Is it a well, lack it was, of resources? I have to say, it was, it was considerably less incompetent in my time than it is... you're actually right, ..than it is now. And, to be honest, the other thing that I hope we didn't do was waste time and money on initiatives like the Rwanda Initiative, well, which is all about getting on the front of the newspaper and nothing about actually solving the problem. Has that been a waste of time, the Rwanda Initiative? And money. I it's just a lot of money. I don't think so. I mean, I think, look, as I think I said in my article, even if Rwanda gets off the ground, um, uh, you know, the Rwanda government said they're only going to take a few hundred in the five-year mm. trial. So it's not enough to provide a deterrent to the 46,000 people that are coming, right? All people, all the people traffickers will do is replace their, is lower their price. So instead of it being $10,000, make it $8,000 because the risk is a bit higher. And on the pursue element, I mean, Jackie will know this from the Home Office, it's a bit like um, fighting drugs, right? If you go for the people and you take them out, great. The NCA, the cops, they're very good at doing that. And there have been arrests in Turkey and elsewhere of people who, who are people trafficking. They basically just get replaced. Well, they get replaced uh, quite quickly. Just before you, before you've we got move to on, close though, down the ability do to do business, which do you, is what I'm trying to propose. Do you think the idea put forward by Kit Malthouse is, is, is worth investigating or not? Well, I mean, I'll leave it for him to investigate his own ideas. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think there is a danger this exposes the risks in, in blue sky thinking a, 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 a bit more. But, but, but like everything, I mean, it's a bit like the Rwanda this is what's issue. wrong with politics. The, the, the test of that policy was never how many people would Rwanda take. It was about the distraction of that politic. And that's exactly what this proposal is about. It's not about a fundamental reform of the system. It's about getting the public to look over there because it ignores the real crisis I don't think in the system. That's true. No, I think really to, to, I think to malign people's that. motives yeah. is, is complete. It's part of the it's civility and politics. If there, if there wasn't and there pattern, are other countries. So when the Danes do it, will you say the same thing? Right? The Danes are looking at it as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, but the, to but we're all struggling with the problem. Cool. And the problem is well, that, that we, every single day, uh, particularly during the summer, there are hundreds of people taking their lives in their hands in the channel. Yeah. Um, and nobody wants to wake up to, to dead bodies on the beach at Deal. And that is the problem that we're trying to solve. Now, if that means people are having to look at issues like Rwanda and other major solutions, then I think they, they should be allowed yeah, to find that space you, to do that. Because their primary right, well, aim Jackie, let, is to stop people dying. But Jackie. you're right that it's about a pull, and that's what gives the criminals the freedom and the incentive to do what they're doing. The best way of stopping the pull is to make decisions quickly when people 
uh, make their claim for asylum. That's the that's the only that's the fundamental way in which you're going. Hang to on, we're going to we're going to move on because we're going to run out of time. I want to show you. Let's see if you can find a solution to this. The Guardian Lidl becomes latest retailer to ration sales of salad ingredients. You will know supermarkets um, have been imposing buying limits on things like peppers and tomatoes. Uh, Jim, Shadow Environment Secretary, you've had a meeting uh, this morning. What's causing these salad shortages? Well, first of all, the lack of a single government plan to ensure or our nation's food security is part of that. The government work in silos, although they haven't got a cross-government plan yeah. uh, on food. But also, they've been missing in action when it comes to support for farmers, when it comes to security in the supply chain. Uh, and in a way, they've allowed our kind of fairly healthy and generally uh, well-run supermarket chains uh, to kind of manage our food security in a way that they've been very hands-off. And the risk of that means that when the supply chain is in, under pressure, which it is at the moment, the government haven't got an answer to that. Well, actually, the answer was, go and buy turnips. Go uh, to turnips by the way, they had everything. Uh, turnips, by the way, which are out of season. They didn't have peppers in my way. Uh, they and so, in the end, if you haven't got a government that's willing to step up on this and have a proper policy that includes farmers, manufacturers and retailers, we're not going to make a breakthrough on this. All right, well, uh, uh, there's one solution here from Mick Hucknell, who you may remember, my days, uh, Simply Red, uh, tweeting, for the sake of balance fairness, can some of our mainland European friends please post photos of their supermarket food shortages. Thanks in advance. Hashtag Brexit oh, benefits. Oh, yeah, hang on, oh, hang on. Oh, oh, oh. Well, all you're of here. a sudden Brexit would kick in four years oh, later. Uh, well, well, it's kicked said. in all the way through this programme. Um, <laughs> this is it, Norman Deed this morning. There you can see an abundance of oh, fruit and kids. salad. Kids. And then, and then just this are you going to continue weekend, interrupting me as well as each other? I will give you the chance. And then this in Brussels this evening, talking of the EU. There we have an abundance of tomatoes. Hang on, we've been told, we've been told that it's about poor weather. Oh, and there's another one. Yeah. Shell's bringing here in Italy. We've been told that it's bad weather um, in southern Spain and parts of North Africa. And yet the supermarkets here, this is only a selection, are full in parts of Europe, but not here. Is Brexit the reason? So the first thing to say is, to say is that small children across the land are cheering. Uh, not what, because they can't get tomatoes. tomatoes and, All right. And, and, and the serious salad. and the serious um, answer. So, um, look, as far as I could see, the, the, I mean, the first thing to say just on Jim's thing is that the, the, one of the most dreaded phrases in business is, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. The idea that the government should be somehow organising the transport of tomatoes from Morocco That's seems not. to be a bit nuts when we've got perfectly good but and very sophisticated private sure sector organisations that can in the UK. do it. As I understand it, it's down to weather. Mm. Seems to be a bit of a problem. I'm sorry, that doesn't Power put costs on, on well, domestic. Hang on. Hang and on. then also price, that our supermarkets aren't willing to pay the price in the same way the Germans and French are. Oh, well, do you buy that? To coin a phrase, or we, is Brexit no, no. a problem? We, we have, we have miles of greenhouses here in the UK that are renter because the government excluded farmers from the energy it's intensive energy support package, so and so they can't be heated. That's why they're empty. Yeah. That's why we have shortages, because we haven't got the resilience here in the UK. Is Brexit a reason in this? Well, this isn't it perfectly possible to say there are a whole range of reasons of there, which it one is, is Brexit? Oh, please, come it's, it's definitely an impact well, in terms of Labour. It's definitely that, an impact on, on Labour. Kit? Don't you think that, it, for example... Brexit in does of, not control the weather. I'd love to no, think that I we said make it there sunny are, days every day. Kit, but... you're desperate to defend Brexit oh, no, to the I just point think it's any where you won't even accept interrupt. that it may be an element in what we're facing. You know, there's a problem in this debate that it's either all Brexit or not Brexit at all. No. It's perfectly possible no, to in say the, the... there are elements of this shortage in... that are exacerbated by Brexit. There are elements of this shortage that are exacerbated by the fact that the government could have seen it coming and did nothing about it and preferred to talk about turnips. There are elements of well, this that are about the weather. Of the tomato crop but in Morocco. not being honest, not resilient. being honest about the range of You've factors. Is not not I mean, is that the problem that it's too polarised? I mean, could Brexit be a factor? People I... will look at pictures like this and say, why are there tomatoes and peppers in supermarkets across France, across Italy, yes. and across Spain, and yet yes. not here? Yes, well, I, energy I prices could be part of. I'm perfectly prepared actually to agree with Jackie's position that there may be a range of factors here but I would like to know specifically what it is about Brexit that caused the problem with the tomato supply. I think um, things that have contributed to increases in energy costs, We're not shortages to do with Brexit, of lead, they're more to do with Ukraine. Short, 
they're partly to do. Well, this is another area well, where you've got Labour. elements that are to Brexit. do with Ukraine and elements that are to do with Brexit, as are Labour shortages. This is there aren't Labour shortages. There We've are, got a there lot are. of extra people actually. Just well, not hang on, hang on, hang on. There are. I think you're, in agriculture there are Labour shortages. Right. I mean, the government's interpretation of Brexit and the cap they put on exactly. seasonal workers. That's the issue. Just go I mean, is that fact. is that one of the problems? The, the the seasonal workers issue. We were talking about it actually just as we were coming we need on to get air. Our own people working. There There's is a, a million there is, more people on out of work benefits. But there is a genuine issue with seasonal workers, work. and we have a seasonal worker scheme now uh, that well, you know, has been negotiated with the NFU and farmers to get people in to do that kind of fruit and vegetable picking as as required. Right. So the, I'm not pretending there aren't. Um, issues to do with the, um, the kind of workforce, but then there have been in the past over the years, and in fact we've had problems in the past even when we were in the EU. I mean, the EU is no guarantee of supply, um, and indeed most of it, quite a lot of our tomatoes now come from Morocco, which has nothing to do with the EU whatsoever. Right, so... so the, you know, the, 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 the issue is not about where those goods come from. We've always benefited from a uh, you know a worldwide supply of our food what we haven't got at the That's moment because of the government because of Moroccan no, tomatoes no, no, to the left be, 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 because because of the government is that we haven't got domestic resilience oh, in place you know there's been 7000 food businesses that have gone out of business since 2019 on this government's watch that reduces our resilience oh. and all the issues about labor about the lack of resilience on gas and energy costs for our greenhouses all that finds its way straight to the door of the government who do not take responsibility good well, I, I don't know. I mean, Therese seems to be taking responsibility for it. I mean, she's asking oh, questions. One example. She, one example. sitting down with the food industry on a regular basis to What's talk the about one supply. things that she has done that's going to make a difference say, on the ground? The one the thing. End, oh, just one. In the end, as I say, uh, just one. The one example. I'll tell you exactly food what is... the government is doing since Brexit. They are completely reforming the common agricultural policy so that it doesn't disadvantage our own British farmers in the way that it. Did. You can only make that so, comment if you haven't spoken to a farmer. Because far to farmers are absolutely farmers. up in raw. I've written raw. a whole book about no, no. this, actually, so I do know <laughs> well, what I'm talking well, about. Well, I, I speak to farmers every week, and every single yeah, one, we have every, uh, without, absolutely. Let him finish. Absolutely, every week, of course I do. I was in Lancashire the other week. I'm in uh, Southport <coughs> on Thursday. I met with the NFU uh, today. And the reason why farmers is a is because the government are deliberately changing direct payments and because of that, a third of farmers are not financially viable without that direct support. That's happening because of the, the so actions of the government. So you oppose the environmental conditional handouts. You can do both, but it's a balance. They're going through a cost of living crisis and an input crisis. And there's an underspend of nearly a billion pounds, we're told, in the ELM scheme that could be used for a fair transition for farmers that helps them get over the hump of the cost of living crisis I'm and the input crisis. And the government are no, choosing not to. And, and well, as, we, uh, part, part of the problem, problem as well, what you've done. On, on, part of the problem on the food okay rubbish is there is a, let, let, okay let, 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 let respond. There is a bit of panic buying going on, which is causing a bit of shortage, a bit like the bog roll riots during the pandemic. So hopefully the whole thing will settle itself down quite soon. You're blaming consumers now, OK? But somehow I don't think we're all going to get You're blaming consumers for not eating enough turnips. Well, I think this is the point. This is the point at which... Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. This is the point at which it might be appropriate to come to civility <laughs> in public <laughs> life um, because this is a foundation, it's the Joe Cox Foundation. Uh, we can uh, see a picture of Joe Cox uh, tragically uh, murdered um, and David Amos seven years later. He was also murdered, Conservative MP, uh, former uh, Labour MP. Um, what is the point of this commission? for yep. civility in public life? Because we all want civility in public life. Exactly. And when Joe was, was murdered in 2016, I think a lot of people felt that that might bring people to a position where they understood the damage that abuse and intimidation were doing. Uh, what we've actually seen since then is, if anything, a worsening of that. Last year, 70% of councillors said they'd experienced abuse and intimidation. Um, between 2017 and 2019, the amount of abuse for candidates standing in elections actually increased. So there is a problem here. We talk a lot about the problem. What the Commission is about is actually, as Joe would have done, saying... This is difficult, but it's not insoluble. So what are people's experiences and what are people's suggestions about how we could improve it? And what we're going to be doing between now and the summer is taking evidence, listening to people who experience it and have good ideas, and coming forward with recommendations, which we will then advocate for and campaign to get put into place. Is there, though, a significant difference between what happened to Joe Cox and David Amos? I mean, they were murdered by extremists. 
that, of course, is totally different to what you're talking about also, the daily abuse that MPs face. I mean, do you think they need to be treated quite separately in that sense? Or when you say not enough has been done, are you talking about increased security for MPs who come face to face with the public? Um, yes, of course there is a difference. And when you have essentially terrorist attacks like this, that's mm. a job for the police and for the security agencies. But there is a environment created for extremism that starts with the abuse and intimidation that every single person around this table will understand happens to democratically elected politicians. And the reason why it matters is because it is also putting people off coming into politics. You know, we've had a lively debate today. That's what I want to see. This isn't about somehow or another suggesting that we all need to be nice and soft with each other the no. whole time. Actually, if people are put off coming into politics, you're restricting political debate. You're making it more difficult for people to have their say, to argue through the issues and the politics that is at the heart of our democracy. So it's an attack on our democracy. And if Jo was here, she would have done something about it. And that's what we're trying to do in the Commission. What would you do about it, if anything, in terms of tackling it? Well, I, I think the aims of it are laudable. I mean, whether it will make any difference or not, we'll have to wait and see. I mean, you know, I mean, I, during my whatever twenty odd years in in politics, I have to say that I've lived through the advent of social media and uh, the fact that lots and lots of people are seduced into popularity on social media by saying awful, dreadful, mm. you know, aggressive things about other people. Um, seems to be what drives a huge amount, certainly the abuse that that I get online. Um, I have to say, I think it also starts with with members of parliament. I think the way members of parliament treat each other sets a tone and sets, a, um, uh, sets an approach. I mean, I, I hope I've always uh, operated on the basis that my view is Jim is, is misguided. He's not evil, um, <laughs> right? I think he's just wrong. Well, that's really um, sure. But there's quite a lot of people who regard me because I'm a conservative as intrinsically evil and wicked. Um, and they, you know, will provide the abuse. Same is true. I mean, the person who gets the most abuse of all of us is Diane Abbott, yep. um, uh, astonishingly, who I've known mm. for a long time in, in London politics. And, and I find that that's where it starts. So I hope at that end of, of kind of civil discourse, we can get to a position where nobody involved in politics calls anybody else involved in politics intrinsically evil or wicked or scum or whatever it might be. Um, at the other end, you know, when you meet MPs uh, and other parliamentarians from overseas, they are astonished at how unguarded MPs are oh. here, how unsecured MPs are here. Oh. You know, we, I met some um, members Is that of right? they from, do... from Turkey. They all get cars and drivers and but security people. But in a sense, that's the it? beauty of our democracy. I agree. It? And it was always so disappointing, well. you know, the years I spent in the lobby as a political journalist based at Westminster, every time there was some kind of infringement of security at Parliament, more barriers went mm -hmm. up. You then had more screens and less access for ordinary people to their politicians. Well, and that is the key. Is, I mean, would you like to see more security? I mean, do you worry when you have your surgeries or when you're going to events? So you are unguarded in that sense, aren't you? Well, I mean, security definitely has increased and it's improved. So uh, MPs okay. can call in support for, uh, for advice surgeries. Uh, not, not for events, but certainly for static uh, advice surgeries. We all have an assessment of our private homes. Uh, we all have a personal assessment of our, of our movements and the, the way that we move around. But, but in the end, I think we do have a problem. And the problem is that for too many people, they separate out for reasons only known to themselves. And talk about authorities, you know, whether it's uh, police forces around the country, there is no uniform approach to this. Different police forces take it very differently where the online world is treated very differently to the real world, that almost like the two should never come together. And I just say this, the person who is making threats online is a real person. Mm. They are sat at home mm. and they are making the threats and they are being incited somehow. I, I've been through the experience of somebody going through court, somebody being convicted of making death threats, and the impact that has, not just on me, uh, but, but it was significant, yes, but also on staff and on your family, yeah. you know, because you, ha you mm. have to take these threats seriously. Yes. Uh, and so we do need to go, go further. We do need to see an improvement uh, with the response from authorities, the response from online uh, media companies. Uh, but we need to be careful that we don't take away that bit that is special, which is that MPs in Britain are as poachable. And, yes. and, and people to would... set an example, I have to say. I mean, I have to say, Jackie, in 11 years of live TV, 
Nobody has ever turned to me and spat, shut up. Now, you could get a well, lot I'm, worse than that, I'm and I get sorry. much worse online. But I, it isn't setting a high I standard, I apologise. I apologise for telling you to shut up. I don't think I spat. I've, nev I've never told anyone to shut up on live well, TV. Well, so, you are a good example then, Isabel, and <laughs> well, I apologise. Probably not always, but I'm trying I to be. I apologise for telling um, you to look, shut up. But look, it's fine for there to be robust debate, as you say. Yeah. Um, and all of us get an absolute kicking online. It is. It goes with the territory, but it's where it crosses the line. It can become quite frightening. And, and I think exactly. everybody around this table and, has experienced. And when are you that. going to report when's this commission? So we're going to be gathering the recommendations up to the summer. Then we're going to be um, we're gathering the suggestions. Then we'll be putting together a set of recommendations that we'll be reporting in the autumn. Then we'll be campaigning to get them delivered and changed. That's all we have time for today. I'll be back with Prime Minister's questions tomorrow at 11.15. From all of us here, bye-bye.